Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Paul Bloom and Jennifer Sr. Thanks for joining us. FAN celebrates its 40th anniversary this year, and we're honored to have the robust support of dozens of schools, nonprofits, corporations, families, and individuals from across the country. We're committed to our vision of an informed and compassionate community, and will achieve that vision by presenting fresh ideas that elevate minds, expand hearts, and make the world a better place. We have hundreds of videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to get updates when new recordings are, re are posted. Now, introductions. Paul Bloom, who's just the nicest man, is the Brooks and Suzanne Reagan Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Yale and a psychology professor at the University of Toronto. His work seeks to uncover how children and adults understand themselves, others, and the world at large, with a special focus on pleasure, morality, fiction, religion, and art. His research is heavily interdisciplinary, incorporating concepts from cognitive, social, and developmental psychology, as well as evolutionary theory, behavioral economics, and philosophy. Prior to Psych, the book, uh, Professor Bloom authored six other books, which all get to the roots of different human phenomena written to appeal to laymen and professionals alike. The titles of those books, The Sweet Spot, Against Empathy, Just Babies, How Pleasure Works, How Children Learn the Meanings of Words, and Descartes' Baby. Jen Senior is a staff writer who we love at The Atlantic and winner of the 2022 Pulitzer for Feature Writing. Prior to joining The Atlantic, she spent five years at The New York Times, first as one of its three daily book critics, then as a columnist for the opinion page. Before that, she spent 18 years as a staff writer for New York Magazine, writing profiles and cover stories about politics, social science, and mental health. Her book, All Joy and No Fun, which is how we first met Jen, The Paradox of Modern Parenthood, spent eight weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was named one of Slate's top 10 books of 2014. Now let's welcome Paul Bloom and Jennifer Sr. Lonnie, uh, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. Do I speak for Paul when I say that? I do. I love FAN. Thank you, FAN. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for having me again in May. Um, you're a fabulous organization. Um, and it's true, Paul is really one of the loveliest men on the planet. Um, it's also one of the funniest. Um, so, sorry, nope, no pressure. So it's, a lot of, it's a lot of pressure. Okay, let me jump in. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lonnie, for having me. I mean, it means the world. And thank you, FAN. And thank you, all of the people here watching us. And a big, big thanks to you, Jen. Just before we start off, just say, I want to sort of get get this said that you are one of my favorite writers in the world, and one of my one of, and one of my favorite people. And your and your gifts as a thinker and a person are going to show up in this discussion. And now you have pressure too. Okay, <laughs> it was just mean. <laughs> it was know, lovely, but it was so mean. <laughs> I know, anyway, I know. Thank you, thank you. It was also the, one of the nicest things that will be said about me ever. So thanks. Um, so, and yes, thank you to the audience for being here. I mean, I, I hear there are a lot of you, All right? So we'll try not to disappoint. Um, I'm gonna start with, I always like live in terror of asking the old Charlie Rose question, which is <laughs> why this book, Paul? Why now? Why this book? Yeah, so I'm gonna try and make it more interesting than that. Um, I'll put it a little differently. Uh, you did this magnificent flyover of the field of psychology based on your Psych 101 class that you taught forever at Yale. Maybe you're teaching it at U of T, I don't know. But I mean, it's really, it's delightful. I mean, I wished that I was still a daily book critic just so I could say all these nice things about it. It's lively, it's funny, it is studded with, it's really smart. It's studded with all this unlikely trivia and all these gems. I mean, it was just, it was a thrill to read. But my question about it is, it, it was also very unusual. I mean, yeah. for a psych book, right? Because I feel like you see this in like the physical sciences I feel, or like in, in physics, let's say, you'll see Brian Greene or Michio Kaku explaining yeah. all of physics to you. Like here's string theory and the theory of relativity and the quantum mechanics and how we try and reconcile them all, right? Um, you don't ever see this that I know of really in psychology. So I have three questions based on this long premise, which is number one, what possessed you, right? That's number one. And number two, what in fact were your models? Were they like Brian Greene and Michio Kaku or were they things I'm not thinking of? And 
Number three, which I sort of mean cheekily, but sort of don't. Why would you do such a thing when you and I both know that it's the kind of seductive, sexy books, oversimplified books about cognitive biases like blink and predictably irrational and you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. You invited, yeah, I know you do. They get you invited to TED, right? You didn't do that. I mean, you did something harder and more ambitious and potentially less speaker circuit friendly. So yeah. you want to take those in order. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, why this book was a COVID book and it, it wasn't what I expected it to be. I thought um, I taught intro psych. I had this Coursera course where they made transcripts of me teaching intro psych. I thought, honestly, I just copy down the transcripts, make it into a short book, maybe get enough money to renovate my house and it take me like six months. And then I started doing the Freud chapter and, and the Freud, and I copied down my transcript. I did it in two days, this little anemic thing. This, this isn't good. And then I expanded on it. And I, I read several biographies of Freud. And then all of a sudden I blowed it up. And all of my chapters blow, blow, blow. And I said, this is not a six month project. And it just, it, it, it ended up very different than what I expected. Um, and my you and, and, lecture for lecture, just so I can be clear, like you literally thought you were going to do lecture for lecture with the chapter for chapter, and you thought you could just slightly blow those out and it would be. I thought I was going to copy and paste onto an MS Word file, but do some spelling checks, stick in a footnote, and boom, and then you know, it'd be a, a little book. I was going to call it something like you know a short introduction to the mind, and now the book is is, is blown. It's not short. It's yeah, I mean, it's not it's long. Not it's not like it's, it's just, yeah. Anything, it's yeah. just the right. It's just the right. It's the right, the right yeah. size. Yeah. And so, so you, the, the second question. That's the origin story. The second question is um, is the models, and it's it's a good question. I one of my advisors in grad school was uh, Stephen Pinker, and he's a writer, a very deep guy, and a writer I really admire. And a lot of my other books were sort of writing sort of, you know, writing with, with sort of ideas and exploring them. I mean, he was one of my models as I write. Other people like Richard Dawkins and so on. This book was a bit different. And and I, I know the physicists you're talking about, they weren't my models. My models were actually people like Mary Roach and Bill Bryson. Oh, interesting. Who, who are not scholars in, in particular, they're, they're writers. But Bill Bryson in particular writes this book all about the human body. Or he has a book called something like A Short History of Nearly Everything. Yep. And I said, and I, and I, and it's not boring. It's interesting. And it's deep. And it's, it's honest. It, it deals with the it's real It's very English to do that too. You know, it, the books do that. And he lives there now. So he's an expat. But I wonder if that got into a system. That's, yeah. You know, all my, all my favorite novelists are, are, are English or British. And so maybe, maybe that's, that's, that's part of it. The sort of, the sort of tone to that. Um. And then as I started to write it, the sort of the, the bulk of it became, you know, not a curse, but a pleasure. So to answer your, your third question, I've been teaching and doing psychology for a long time. And I wanted to sort of take it upon myself to, to give the whole field, which is sort of in some ways super ambitious. And there are parts of this, which are my bread and butter research, my chapter on language. I study, I did my dissertation on, on development. That's what I do for a living. But I have a chapter on mental illness. I'm not a clinician. And those were the chapters I like writing the most because I would read tons and tons. And then I would pester my friends, my, I know shrinks and, and, and clinical psychologists. And, and then they'd say, oh, you know, no, obsessive compulsive disorder as of two years ago, isn't uh, uh, an anxiety disorder. After all, it's a different category. And they told me all my mistakes. And, and that was so much fun. So in some way, it was just a pleasure for me to learn about psychology all over again. You know, you, you just, I, can you just tell the audience one of my favorite lines in your book? Um, you said, oh, I'm not that the kind of psychologist. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's a line. It's actually, it's not mine. It's from Susan Fisk. Um, and, and, and it's when you're introducing the book, you say it's about psychology. Oh, I know what psychology is. And it's about mental illness and treatments. And, um, and so I used to be, uh, uh, when people ask me what I do, I said, I'm a psychologist. And they say, Oh, my adolescent son, he has all these problems and everything. Or they say, I had a dream where I was chased by chickens and one of them was my mother. And, and they do this sort of stuff. And, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm not that kind of psychologist. So Susan, this has this wonderful line. I'm a psychologist, but not the kind that helps people. And, and, and that's, that's, that's right. I do research. I explore the mind. But, right, but, but I just I, thought... I, yeah, I, I love that line of hers. 
Yeah, sorry, I only thought of it because you were saying like you, you really enjoyed the chapters that were about the where you had to call the people who help people. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So <laughs> I know I know people who help people. You know, but you know people, right? You're you're those people adjacent to anyway. Yeah, right? yeah. So so I could direct you to somebody who can help <laughs> you if you're, if you're in some sort of but, I'll talk but, to you, you later about referrals. Okay. <laughs> that's right. But but it part of the message of the book is is just how exciting psychology is. Like I I have a chapter on memory. And and there's really, we've discovered stuff about, about memory, the constructive nature of memory, the origin of false memories, how to implant memories, uh, you know, a chapter on Skinner on, on Freud. And, and it's, the clinical part is a really important central part. And, and, and if psychologists could, could help people with depression or schizophrenia or whatever, we will have earned our keep forever, regardless of what else we do. But it isn't the, main, the only thing that we do. No, and, and those parts were not underdeveloped, but I, I loved its breadth. And I, I did want to just ask you, have you ever written a textbook? I mean, have you done a textbook? I have not only not done a textbook, I would, there is not enough money in the world <laughs> to, to uh, okay. a guy we both know, uh, a Harvard professor, reportedly yeah. got a million dollars to write a textbook. And 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 if I hear this, and also and he hated it, so he ended up he ended up getting all his friends to help him write and giving him and giving off the money, like sort of a subcontracting the textbook out. And it's not enough. He said they're enormous. People read them. It's like prison food. You know, people eat prison food because they're in prison. People read textbooks because they have to. No one's ever bought a textbook out of free will. I hate reading them. I hate writing them. I okay. would hate writing them. Uh, I guess. What but could this book be a textbook? I mean, is it sort of your wish that maybe, because you've, it's proof of concept here. It needs yeah. dreary, right? So, yeah. So back to the house renovation part. Um, if people <laughs> use it as a textbook and had their, had their thousands of students, but I would not protest in a bit, but I'll be honest, which is I try to do something, which I think I'm teaching an intro psych course now at University of Toronto. And my book hadn't come out of being, so I, I gave everybody the book, the PDF of the book, and I used the book to teach the course. And I think the course was a lot of fun and people liked, liked the voice. But I'll be honest about something which you will see in the book, which is unlike a textbook, I give my views on things. So I try to be careful when I'm, when I'm doing it to make it clear this is my view. I think this line of research is overrated. This line of research shows great promise. But a textbook almost by definition can't have a voice and this book has a voice for better or worse. Uh, now, you know what, that leads us into a question that I wanted to ask you. I was going to ask you about your first chapter first, but I won't. I'm going to ask you about uh, ones that are still very early on, but because it has a firm, they have firm points of view, I think. You, you mentioned that you talk about Freud and you talk about Skinner. They are these two yeah. giants in the field. They're polar opposites in some ways, right? Freud is all about... Um, our emotional anarchy and the untidiness of our urges. And Skinner is all about, um, you know, urges, smurges, I don't care about your internal state. Uh, you know, if you give me a pig, I can teach it to salsa or whatever you said, do, do the fox fox. <laughs> you said something yeah. like, are you, yeah, like it's all yeah. about conditioning. It, it, was, it was super, it was like a, a really, they were both great questions. Uh, I mean, both, both great chapters. Um, They've both sort of fallen out of favor, right? Neither yeah. is in vogue anymore. Okay. But because they're intellectual giants who define their time and made it, you have a lot of respect. Do you have a preference for one or the other? A strong preference. Um, yeah. I, I wrote, a, I I wrote about I, I wrote about Skinner because Skinner's important and there's a lot he discovered. And but Skinner in some way was a leader of a weird cult. Um and um and where he said, we let's do psychology without talking about emotions, memories, dreams, goals. People debate over whether he said they didn't exist at all, or which is just unseemly to do science about them. But he wanted to have a strip down where those humans are no different from rats or pigeons and so on. And I talk about them, but I find this just weird and unpleasant in a way. This, this denial of consciousness, denial of what matters most. Now, Freud was also the leader of a weird cult, but it's a cult. It's kind of a cooler cult, which is Freud aired in the other direction. Freud had, Freud had too much, you know. Freud, this all this psychodrama and internal conflict, I think the idea is right. 
And I think this is, I think this is Troy's great insight, the importance of the unconscious. The details, penis envy, castration anxiety, the primal scene when you see your parents making love and everybody does this and it just is are bizarre and nobody believes in it anymore. But the core idea is there. Now, I I simply knowing that you're a writer, I would assume that that, that you'd have your love is writing. Yeah, yeah. It's and, a beautiful and, writing. Isn't he an extraordinary? He he won award. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize for literature, which is extraordinary and and unsurprising. And also, I mean, did he pioneer the case study? I'm trying to think. Did somebody come before? I'm I'm sure somebody will say, "Oh, Schlossberg did it in the yeah. 17th century," but but he but he made it he made it big. And and his right. stories in the interpretation of dreams just is this they're weird and bizarre. But he had such a sensibility. Yeah, And I would just think you're, as a writer, you not only respect Freud's writing, but maybe you'd have more sympathy for his approach. You do, you do profile sometimes of interesting people. And, and I, do you, would you call yourself a Freudian? I mean, I, yeah, but I see, I, I feel like I have to be in the closet about this. I mean, I feel like he's the, right. Yeah. Uh, he, it, I mean, You've already mostly done it, but do you want to go a little further and standing yeah. up an argument for all of his legions of haters? Because there are many. He has his share of haters. Uh, some of I I have friends of mine who said, you know, nice book you wrote, fifteen chapters would have been better if it was fourteen chapters. Why did you include this embarrassment? And they mean it with, with love. They say, they say, look, personally, Freud in many ways was a was a monster. Um, a lot of a lot of he's had a lot of biographers and. They paint an unflattering picture. I know Peter Gay's words. book was like nicer than I didn't think it could get, could get worse. And then it yes. like then, then yeah. you have like Frederick Cruz or something. Oh, I know these savage, but yeah. Um, a lot of it, almost everything he said specifically was wrong. Um, it turns out that that the origin of homosexuality probably is not because you were raised only by uh, in a broken home or something like that. Yeah, um, it, there's no such, probably no such thing as penis envy that women have. The, 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 it's, it's, it's all weird. Yeah. But the reason why I keep him is because of his insight about the importance of the unconscious. Um, I mean, the way I, the way I phrase it in the book is that, is that I, a lot of my colleagues are embarrassed about him. It's like, you know, a drug company that got its start by selling meth. And and in that in that they they think he's he, he, his obsession with sex and all of that stuff is just, but we we are in debt to him, because every psychologist now believes that the unconscious plays a huge role in our mental life. I know people who study political psychology, and they're interested in why some people vote for Biden and other people vote for Trump, but they wouldn't dream of just asking people, because even if people would tell the truth. And we said, well, they don't know. We don't know why we do these things. And I think that's a, that's a real insight. We don't. We are not the best uh, explainers of our own behavior. And um, and I think Freud gets gets credit for for imposing the unconscious of it. There's also one more thing which has to do with sex, which is Freud's obsession with sex is often comical. And I have examples of these extreme and bizarre ideas. But there's a critic I, I quote. And and I I forget his name, Barzay, I forget his name, but he pointed out that by talking about how women had sexual desires, how how common sexual and how often bizarre sexual desires could be, he made the world safe in a way for people with unconventional sexual desires. You know, if everybody's yeah. a pervert, then nobody's a pervert. Right. That's and, very and, funny. yeah. And I think I think that's per this is not my insight. I think it, it is a deep insight of another of a different sort of contribution of Freud. Do, uh, would it have been Sandra Gilman who was sort of taught, who may, talked about Freud trying to universalize all the things that were initially kind of attributed to Jews, that they were perverts, oh, that they were feminists? Yes, I've heard that analysis. Yes. Yeah. It, yes, you know, I, I wonder if I don't, he was I think it, it wasn't. It, it might have been him. Might have been some, I mean, the word George comes to mind, but um, maybe that's my uncle is George and is a Freud. <laughs> I don't know. So, I, I'm thinking project, but that doesn't. That, that yes, yes, it's project. It's project. Oh, it's George project. It's pro okay. It's project. okay. Yes. Oh, then, yes. There well, we there go. you go. Yeah, no, that's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and and that and you've also isolated why it is that I think writers still really embrace for it. That's exactly yeah. unconscious motive. If we do profiles, that is exactly it. We are poking and looking and like you're, you're talking about Steve Bannon, and you don't just take him at face at face value what he says, and and you know. 
I, I think the Freudian look is often a sympathetic look, an appreciation of the complexities of people. They're not people are not heroes or villains. Their narratives are not simple. And yeah. so I read a narrative by you, which is regardless of whether or not you take the specific ideas of Freud, it's Freudian in its interest in internal right. complexity. In its orientation. And, that's right. Yeah, no, in its that, orientation. That, yeah, that, that's that's a lovely response. But there's no oh. such thing as a Skinnerian writer. Right. No. <laughs> right. no. By definition, it would be, I mean, what would it, it would be like a, a VCR manual. You know what I mean? <laughs> it would yes. be technical writing or something. Yes, it would it'd be, be the it'd be, it'd be technical. Although you know, Skinner was an English major um, and, and a failed novelist. He wanted to be a novelist. I mean, what little I've read of Skinner. I mean, yeah. that's shock. I mean, somebody should have. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, OK, so now, now I'll go back to the first question that I had, which was I, I really want to ask you this. Your first chapter, it's this great chapter on the brain. And you talk about the theory, the two big theories of the brain, you know, dualism versus materialism. Dualism meaning that our minds and our bodies are separate, Descartes. Um, materialism meaning um, that we are basically meat puppets, that we, we are our brains, that yeah. brain makes thought. Is that Darwin? You, I can't remember. The, the line is from Darwin, brain it makes is from thought. Darwin. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and I get expressing a point of view, you come down very hard, and maybe the science at this point is sort of unambiguous, but it's materialism, it's brain yep. makes thought. Once we're gone, yes, right. Once our brains are gone, we're gone. Right. Okay. So. And you do a nice job of capturing how grim the, the phrase meat puppet, the idea <laughs> that it takes away later. But this is, this is, this is a, a tough pill to swallow. I think it's true. I think materialism is right, but, but, but I think you should, we should appreciate it. It's, it's kind of rough news. Yeah, it, it, well, particularly if you're religious, which I'll sidestep yeah. for now. I, I have a, a, a different question that I wanted to ask you, which was, let's, okay, so let's say we're meat puppets. Let's say that we're just like a bunch of firing neurons, right? You know, um, yep. um, so you can't think about this without thinking about art, artificial intelligence, right? That's eventually where your mind goes. Yeah. And once you're there, I want to know how outlandish you would find it to think about whether or not it's, it would be possible in the future for computers to have feelings, which I would not yeah. have asked 10 years ago, it would have seemed silly or whatever. But I think about ChatGPT writing yeah. reasonably good papers about Jane Austen, or yeah. more recently and more weirdly, like telling a New York Times reporter to leave his wife. Yeah, he says, we just had Valentine's Day <laughs> dinner together. Says, yeah. you, you, and we loved it. No, you didn't love it. She finds you boring. You find her boring. And, and you know, just in, in, in some sort of gross way, tries to undermine his love for his wife so that he could get together with it or whatever. Yeah, so you're, yeah exactly. So you remember. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, how, how crazy is my question? It's not crazy at all. It's, it's so, you know, what a psychologist will tell you, a psychologist like me will tell you is, is um, we make... There's two big claims. One claim is that physical things can be intelligent. At the time of Rene Descartes, the idea would be laughable that a mere physical thing could play chess or have a conversation. And so we can't be physical things since we could do that thing. Well, we now know physical things can because we built them. We built machines that do intelligent things. And we now know how neural networks can work together to uh, to give an intelligence like that in our brains. That's not a, that's, a, there's an enormous amount to be worked out, but that's sort of common science we're doing now. But then there's consciousness, sentience, feelings, falling in love, getting angry, the feeling of holding your newborn, slamming your car, your hand in a car door, that sort of thing. And it's pretty clear that this is done by our physical brain. But honestly, and this is where I'm going to get humble about our feel, nobody knows how. And nobody knows whether it's somehow the stuff, the flesh, the meat that gives rise to these feelings or whether it's the computations. And you might think that's an abstract philosophical question, but that brings us to your question, which is a very practical one, which is as these AIs get smarter and smarter, and it is blowing my mind. I will, I will make myself out to be a, a bad predictor, which is I would have never thought this would have happened so quickly. I would have, I would have said we would have got chat GPT in 20 years from now, but now we have it now. And as they get better and better, and as we put them in machines that talk, so we're talking to them and then put them in bodies that move around. Your question isn't a crazy one at all. Your question is one they're going to struggle with, which is, do these things have feelings? Do they have consciousness? And because um, if they do, it makes a huge difference. 
And how would we know? I mean, if the outcome gets so good that they are, that they're a plausible simulacrum of a feeling thing. I'm That's right. And and what somebody would say, well, how do we know for each other? How do we know for dogs? How do we know for cats? You you know, I'm sure I look conscious to you, but maybe there's nothing inside. And well, well, you know, <laughs> well, we're just the same species, and you know, this guy, it, this guy. Uh, like, I mean, I think about this, you know, in other contexts too. I mean, you know. I sometimes, when I talked to Steve Bannon, thought that if I pulled his back off, there would just be coils and springs. You know, yeah. I, mean, I, I wasn't sure. You know, I mean, I'm kidding. Yeah. But no. I mean, you know, I saw him get emotional and things. But you know, nonetheless. But but it's it's a great question. This guy, um, Blake Lamone or something from Google, hmm. lost his job because he worked with this AI, this chatbot, but six months before ChatGPT came out, and he became convinced it was sentient and was held by Google as a slave, an unpaid slave. So he tells his bosses at Google, you should free this machine. And they promptly fire him because they're very unhappy. And then this becomes a big thing. And everybody makes fun of him on Twitter. Like this crazy guy who thinks this chatbot is, is sentient. But I think he's the canary in a coal mine. I think, I think it's, it's like, I think this issue is going to come up more and more. People are going to interact with these things and come to the conclusion that they really have feelings as they become more part of our lives. And there's going to be a certain point where we're going to stop laughing at that because we're going to be, we might be such people. We might wonder. And I don't know how we're going to tell. I'm just thinking about whether this is something my son is going to confront, you know, he's 15. And I mean, it, it's, it's a very provocative thing to say, like this could happen much sooner than we thought. GPT happened much sooner than we thought. It, okay. it is, it is, I think that the biggest, to me, it's the biggest scientific surprise that we have AIs now like that. Well, and, and the growth seems to be not linear, but exponential, you know, right. you're in a bit, you're in a business, what's going to happen when the Atlantic starts getting submissions that are right now, you could tell when the chat GPT writes it, they're wooden, they're, they're, they're sort of a, they're, 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 there's an, a sort of high school essay like style to them. But, but I don't think there's any principle way that they can't get better and better. Right. I mean, and for that matter, somebody could write something that's almost as good as psych. What if they write something that is as good as psych? I mean, or could, rather, you know? I mean, talk about consciousness and worries about consciousness. The real worry is that we'll be out of a job. Right. I mean, how, how far are we away from somebody putting together your, your collected works, giving it to one of these things and said, write something like Jen Senior. That sounds like, oh, I think like, I mean, honestly, I feel like two years. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I think maybe two I, years. Yeah. And and when this conversation is over, I'm going to go and ask ChatGPT, write me a little essay about something in the style of you. And I'll see if it, if it looks like you. Oh my God, send it, it to it's, me. It's, well, recorded, it's it. recorded a lot of your things. Your, your, <laughs> it, no, it's read your stuff. Right. Not, right. not the more recent stuff. It sort of shuts off two years. It's read your, your stuff. You can do Has, it. So have you ever asked it to to write in your style? Do you know if it does? If I it have. It, does, it's, it, doesn't do a, it doesn't do to me a very good good job. Um, that's but, reassuring. Um, but uh, maybe I'm not the best judge. No, but that's reassuring. All right, let's move on to something that's not so dark. Um, do you have a favorite cognitive bias? I love oh. this section. Yeah, um, I... I I think there's one bias that kind of rules them all. So, so, so people like uh, Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for this work in collaboration with Amos Tversky, have studied all of these biases that they're not, they're not, they don't make us stupid. They're like shortcuts. Like when you ask me how common something is, I see how quickly it comes to mind. And in some way that leads us, that leads us astray sometimes. So people overestimate the likelihood of terrorist attacks and plane crashes because they come to mind very quickly. But we have all these biases. For me, the number one bias that shows up everywhere and including myself is generally called the my side bias. Mm -hmm. um, though the, 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 the writer, Julia Galef had a more colorful way of putting it. She calls it the soldier mindset. And the soldier mindset is you're not interested in exploring the world. You're not a scout, you're a soldier. And what you want to do is you want to take over territories and defend it and, and, and arm yourself against everything. And I see it in myself all the time. When I fall in love with an idea, everything supports the idea and everything that goes against the idea is nonsense. And, and this has been demonstrated a thousand times in the lab, but, but it, is so, it is so much part of everyday life. Wait, and it's different from the cons confirmation bias in that it's, it's what you see, it's what you're attuned to? 
People think the confirmation bias is actually a sub, a, a sort of a, a type of the my side bias, a particular okay. instance of it. The my side bias in general is, is that you look for information that confirms your way of seeing the world and you reject information that, that, that doesn't. Um, and it shows up very much in the political realm. Well, yeah, everyone's Twitter and feed. Everyone's Twitter feed. Everyone's Twitter feed. You know, a long time ago, people wondered if you're liberal, why do you subscribe to liberal magazines and not conservative magazines? Wouldn't it be interesting to hear views that are opposed to yours? Which is what somebody would say if they never met a person. I mean, what people what people <laughs> want is um is uh, uh they want they want confirmation for their views. Um, Julia Galef provides sort of. A very simple, uh, se several simple examples. But one example is, you know, they say um, if you're sued for something, and the suit uh, is groundless, is rejected, um, you should. Do you think uh, you should have to pay for the lawyer costs? And people say, say, uh, no. Sorry, if you sue somebody, should you have to pay? No. But if you're sued, then the other person should pay. And you find this <laughs> reflection. Um, Gamers reject stories of it that are that are negative to gamers. Catholics reject stories that are negative to Catholics. There's a powerful bias. There's also there's also yeah. one of the best Twitter jokes by John Ronson about the confirmation bias, which is once I heard about the confirmation bias, I couldn't help but see it everywhere. So it's, oh my it's, god, <laughs> just, it's just oh that's but, in your book. Wait, that's in your book. That is my that is so. I don't know. Do you have do you have a bias that resonates to you? As you I do, this? I do, and you know what? I'll have you tee it up. I'll have you, okay. not that it resonates. It was just, it was one of my, yeah, I, I was very responsive to this in your book. I do. Um, okay, let me see if I can. So it's the bias that sort of makes it possible for a guy to think that a woman, <laughs> a really great looking woman is way more interested in him yeah. than she actually is. Like, oh, yeah. that chick is into me. So yeah. do you want to, do you want yeah, to talk about so it? So there's there's a literature in social psychology about how the healthy mind, the non-depressed, cheerful mind, is optimistic and overconfident. Um, one version of this is called uh, the Lake Wobegon effect, after Garrison Keillor's line about the place where all the children are, everybody's above average, and it's the above average effect. You ask people, are you a, an average driver, below average driver, better than average driver? Most people say they're better than average. They have a better than average sense of humor. They're better than average friends. They're better than average at everything. Everybody's better than average. And there's different manifestations of it, but in some cases, you could think it's rational. And it might be rationally overconfident about your abilities or your, or your charm. In cases where if you're right, and if you try something and you're right, the rewards are great. And if you fail, the rewards, the, pun, the, the cost isn't so bad. And the example that there's a the scientific literature on is your example. Um, heterosexual men tend to think that, we, that they're, they're much more attractive to women than, um, than, than they really are. And this and leads to sort of- more attractive to them. Yes, women are, that's right. They're, they're more attractive, that's right. Women are more attractive yeah. to them. Yeah. And so you might see this from sort of a strict game theoretic perspective. That's pretty rational because what this means is, you know, this man, they're hitting on a lot of women. You find me very attractive, they say, and they're hitting a lot of women. And I would say, no, oh, okay, well, that's that. But sometimes they get it right. And then, and when they get it right, it's romance and sex and love, and it's fantastic. Right. This is very good for the heterosexual men. It's not very good for the heterosexual women. So this is a case where. Um, right. Although I liked that it was a sympathetic and rational explanation for it. Yes. It, low cost, high reward. Low cost, high reward. When it's low cost, high reward, it makes sense to be overconfident. Right. When it's high cost, then it's kind of different. Um, I quote from Omar in The Wire, um, you shoot at the king, you best not miss. Best and not miss. there's some sort of cases where it makes sense to be, for instance, a bit more anxious about crime and, and violence than then is warranted because the cost of getting of getting it wrong is you could get injured or killed and mm -hmm. and the benefits and so so you're extra cautious and there's an idea that our optimism pessimism is kind of calibrated to the environment in certain ways can we go back to the late wobegon effect for a second yeah um do you think that's why so many maybe i'm misidentifying the bias but is that why so many members of Congress think that they can be president? 
I mean, do they just have a disproportionate number of people telling them that they should run for president or that, I mean, maybe that's yeah. not. Yeah. No, no, that that's Is exactly that's exactly it. I you 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 have these you have like like sixty people probably all says I have a pretty good chance of being president. Yeah, I, at least no, president. no, yeah, they right. don't. Right, but right. But one theory of the Lake Wobegon effect is what you alluded to, which involves the sort of feedback people get, which is, I imagine a lot of people are surrounded by people who say, you know, you could be president. You are of presidential caliber, says the person who works for you. Right. Says the person toting up for you. And, right. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like, and, and so it might be that this sort of feedback gives rise to this overconfidence in some cases. You know, I give a talk. And somebody who likes to talk might come over to me and say, oh, I enjoyed that talk. Somebody who doesn't like to talk isn't going to, you know, unless they're kind of weird, isn't going to come in and say, hey, I found your talk very boring. Right. They, they were well-raised. Right, right, so, right. That's right. So surrounded by well-raised people, I said, that was some talk. I mean, right. social, media, social media is the worst of it. So we both know people, I assume you know people too, who say things on social media, which are, are terrible, they're cruel. They're, they're just, and what happens is a um, hundred people like that. So they get a hundred likes. This I'm, people love me, and then a thousand people think, "What a jerk!" But there's no "you're a jerk" button on Twitter. There's no dislike button. There's right. no dislike button. So there's a positive feedback, even for bad behavior, that leads people to think, "I must be the wittiest, you know, uh, funniest, smartest person in the world." In some well, way, this the social feedback. I never thought of it this way before, but the feedback systems like Twitter or Facebook is meant to encourage overconfidence. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. I think that people have an outside sense of who yeah. they are. I think twi Twitter narcissism is its own other category, just based on like, it's sort of asymmetrical, right? Like you said, 100 people say yeah. this, and therefore you think you're terrific, when there are legions who think that what you said was, you that's, know, horrible. that's right. That's right. And I, I was once talking to an academic, and he started telling me about how difficult it was to be famous. And I'm thinking, you're not famous. You're famous well, in, in the field of psycholinguistics. But I, but but the guy who played some third part, some, some minor role in a, in a situation comedy from the 1980s is a million times more famous than you. But the thing is, in his life, he gets feedback saying, I really liked your paper there. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I want to talk to you. And he thinks, I must be famous. When I was at op-ed, a columnist said to me that, describe themselves as famous. And I looked at them and said, Tom Hanks is famous. <laughs> you know, how did break this to you? You're, you're really not famous. Like you're just not, you know? yeah. but it, it is a very strange phenomenon. Um, but where, where would we be? So we're, we're making fun of these, the, I, you know, of the people, but where would we be if we didn't inflate ourselves a bit? I mean, not, not to sort of get meta, but, but even the idea of you and I just talking here requires some degree of maybe overconfidence. Sometimes, so I, I've been, I was the opposite. Uh, oh, I see, insecurity. Yeah. Oh, that's probably, yeah. I mean, it, it, point taken though. I mean, you're actually, where would we be if, if, right? Where would any of us be if people didn't have the audacity to keep, you know, asking for lots of money in order to invent things that eventually are transformative. I mean, I think about this all the time and, you know, and why are more of them men? I think about this a lot. Yeah. I think, you know, I think it's an important question. We're kind of, this is something I was going to say for the end, but since we're on the subject of confidence, uh, this is sort of orthogonal. It's not, it, I'm coming at this at a slightly different angle. Um, the, the, if you get, I don't know how many reviews you've gotten so far, but if you get a, a scathing review for this yeah. book from someone, what are, are you going to think that it was you or are you going to think that it was the critic not getting it? Because there was a really interesting thing that you noted in your book about what this says about your frame of mind and how depressive you are. And I, I want the audience to hear about this because I think it's super fascinating and relevant to what we're talking about now. It's a really good question. Um, I I wish I could take criticism better, in a sense that I like. I wish because there's really a lot of smart people in the world, and it's easy to take it when they're critical of you, but they're nice. Mm -hmm. 
and I have a lot of wonderful dialogues, but uh, where people say, oh, I disagree with this part. I think you put too much emphasis on it. And I have a wonderful conversation. I find it very interesting and I'm very willing to deal with the criticism. But what if they're cruel or sarcastic or, or you know, they make a joke at my expense? And it is very difficult for me to appreciate that sometimes people could be awful and, um, and but actually be right and that I should listen to them. And, and so my response to criticism are, in some senses, in some cases, anger and like mean criticism. But also in some cases, and this is what you're getting at is, oh my God, they got my number. They, uh, you know, you're, I, you take I, uh, their side. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is this is maybe the depressive side of myself where I lack the sort of, um, you know, sometimes I see people say, oh, this isn't very good about my work. And I say, you're more perceptive than most people. I fooled everybody, but I haven't fooled you. And uh, and a little bit of that's okay. What, what about you? I'm the same way. No, exactly. And I, I think, and it speaks to the melancholic in me. I, and, but I, I, I think, oh my God, they're right. It, I, I, I've seen others. I think I'm sure you have colleagues who do this, who say, you know, screw them. It's their problem. They didn't yeah. get it. You know, and I'm, I, I envy those people, you know, but I was just curious. I mean, you give a very heartfelt personal answer. And, and you, you know where I see it a lot is this for professors and student evaluations. I've had, I, I know friends of mine, they have to get like a hundred people say, oh, what a superstar. It changed my life. Wonderful. And they, they stood staring at this one. And they, they send it to all their friends say, look what they said about me. And, you know, and, you know, professor has a squeaky voice and, you know, it's true. I have a squeaky voice and <laughs> they're, and that's the, and that's, and then years later, they say, oh yeah, 10 years ago, I remember, that's when I got that evaluation about my squeaky voice, so. And it's the one thing they remember. Well, it's I mean, the one thing I remember. is that a bias that we have? Do we remember? Well, you've, I guess Kahneman has talked about this yeah. somewhat. I mean, highs, lows, yeah. So, so to... there's all these, these biases that are self-enhancement, but we also have what's called a negativity bias that we, we need to focus on bad news often. And it's really an adaptive thing, you know? It's really more interesting to important for you to focus if you hear there's a murder on the loose than if there's a really nice person on the loose. Because right. because bad things, think about the worst thing that could happen to you. Think about the best thing. The bad, the worst is much worse than the best thing is good. Yeah. And so it's good to know when people don't like you. It's good to be, but you got to put this in in balance. And it's sometimes shocking to see otherwise self-confident people being brought down by a simple, mean, and nasty comment. And, and yet we yeah. see it all the time. And and I'm doing exactly what a, and, and I'm aware of this in case people, I'm doing exactly what psychologists tend to do, which is I'm I'm saying the psychological evidence, the theory points in both directions. One thing we had the self-enhancement thing, and it's, but also we're vulnerable to criticism. What am I going to say? It's complicated. Well, I, I think you're also saying that it's context dependent, it's right? Context, when the, when it's the very stakes context are high, dependent. you know, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it depends on, yes, right. Um, and also who we are, right, you know, characterological, I mean, it makes sense. Um, so psychology has um, run into a few problems, <laughs> you know, in recent years. A, little, a few bumps in the road. A few bumps in the road. Yeah. Um, so I, do you want to talk a little bit about the replication crisis? You yes. Want to talk and, and, and one of my chapters is on the crisis. And, okay. and, and I feel that, you know, I want to sell psychology. I want to make a case for it. I want to talk about its very best uh, uh, discoveries and theories and ideas. But, but in some ways, we really should be humble. The replication crisis is the findings that emerged 10, 20 years ago that significant studies fail to replicate. We had these, these things you learn about if you were an undergraduate taking psych, these classic experiments, nobody get them to work again. When you do them properly, they don't work. And now sometimes it could just happen through luck. You know, aspirin is good for headaches, but you do an experiment and aspirin doesn't help the headaches. Just random luck. It didn't work out. But it's not luck. It's, um, it's because we were doing our experiments in shoddy ways. We were, we were analyzing the data opportunistically. We were running tons and tons of statistical tests. You run 50 statistical tests. One of them is going to turn out to work just by chance like flipping coins over and over again and then screaming, oh my God, I got five heads in a row. I'm a magician. You know, no, you just do it enough. You get it by chance. And then we'd, we'd get our discoveries and we write our papers saying, here's our discovery. And because we were doing it shoddily, 
we're now in a crisis and and a lot of and we have really tried to clean up our act and test do experiments differently and that's maybe not the worst of it so the other problem which which is a problem of psychology is we've been focused on a very narrow subpopulation of humans typically american undergraduates you know people from the west predominantly somebody once estimated that an american college freshman is over 400 times, 4,000 times more likely to be the subject of a psychology experiment than somebody who lives in China, India, or Africa. Just everybody, the entire yep. population of them. And we're trying to clean up our act that act in those ways as well, as well. But because of these problems in psychology, a lot of the findings that that I had taken very seriously and I used to give, I used to teach my students are not true. And, and this is a real blow to the field. There was an acronym for the sample society. Yes. You want to it's explore? um it's we study this is an acronym thought up by uh, Joe Henrik and his colleagues and we we study weird people, and weird is an acronym for Western educated industrialized rich democracies. Uh, we study we study people who live in in Germany and United States and Canada, and you know in a few other countries, and and maybe it it could have worked out well that's okay. Because all our minds work the same way anyway. But unfortunately, it turns out that in different parts of the world, there are different, um, our psychologies differ in some ways, and our findings are generalized. So even what we're talking about, the sort of self-enhancement, Lake Wobegon thing, may be a very Western thing. Okay, so you're anticipating my next question, which is, if psychology actually um, starts to sample more broadly, look at a wider range of human beings from different cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different age demographics than college students. If it starts to do that, what do you suspect might be upended? What chestnut yeah. psychology, you know? I think what will stand is a lot of our findings about perception and language and memory and reasoning and rationality. I think a lot of this shows up in other species, a lot of it that uh, it shows up sort of universally. I think what will change is a lot of generalizations we make about our social natures, which might be more dependent on our cultures than we think, uh, than, than we naturally think. And also maybe some, a lot of clinical psychology. A lot of generalizations you make about what it is to be depressed or schizophrenic or suffer from anxiety might be very different in Africa or India, say, than it is United States, both in how these things manifest themselves, in the way they're treated by other people and what the cure would be. And I think as psychology gets more global, we're gonna be we're gonna make some discoveries and it's gonna change our minds about certain things. The social aspect makes perfect sense. I had not thought about the mental illness or the way that we conceive it. That that's really provocative. I like that answer a lot. So you know one of the things I talk about in the book is sort of neurodiversity movement, yeah. which which is which I have some sympathy for. It's the idea that in some cases some deviations from normal are to be celebrated or to be to be allowed for and not immediately stigmatized. But I do believe in mental illness. There is such a thing as real mental illness. I think I think we should think of schizophrenia as akin to cancer. It's it's not it's not a new way of life. It's not a different way of thinking. It is a savage disease that destroys lives. And it has a very biological and genetic basis. But what it is to be schizophrenic in one culture is different from another culture. And, and one of the interesting findings of, of cross-cultural clinical psychology is schizophrenia is particularly a terrible disease to get in the industrialized West. You end up in an institution, you end up on the streets, you end up shunned. Other societies are kind of more mellow about the delusions and hallucinations and somewhat inappropriate behavior to come from schizophrenia. And as a result, the schizophrenics don't have this sharp uh, 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 break from society. So part of the problem with schiz being schizophrenic in New York City is as soon as you have your delusions up, you lose your friends, you lose your family, and then you lose the sort of reality check that other people provide. But what if you had these problems, but you still had people around you put up with you and then you don't you have sort of people correcting you and, and you're not out of the social network 
Uh, you just anticipated. I was going to say, I wonder if it's different in states with strong welfare, strong yeah. welfare and safety nets, or where there's more social capital, where you're in tighter communities, where there's more extended family networks, et cetera, et cetera. And I will, I will actually take this to say, you know, your writing has, has I, I'm a fan of your writing, but one case where your writing has really influenced me and influenced my thinking is your discussion about parenting and effects of, and whether parents are happier, more fulfilled, more meaningful life than non-parents. And one of the findings that's come up, including some recent stuff, which you probably know about more than I do, is that um, in some way there's a real parenting hit for say in the United States, uh, which is parents at a certain point are very are typically un unhappy, um, maybe less happy than, than people who don't have, have kids, but in other places with better support for parents, both financial support, but also sort of social support, parents are a lot happier. They're happier. I know. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's a very nice for you to make. This is about you. Thank you. Um, we have time for, I'm going to, I have two other questions that I want to ask that are interrelated. You can answer one or both or whatever. One is I'm, I'm curious whether or not there's a psychological trend that you think is kind of overrated. And my final question was going to be, I know it's a tough one and you might offend colleagues. You can skip it if you don't want to. But my final question, and you've done this magnificent overview. And I'm wondering how hard it was to figure out what you have had, what you were going to leave out yeah. and whether there's already stuff that you're regretting that you left out. I'll give a quick answer, both great questions. I wrote a whole book called The Sweet Spot that drew heavily on positive psychology and the psychology of happiness. I think, but... I think so much of that work is overblown, is hype, is flim flam. It's the stuff of of the lesser TED talks and um, and 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 the, the crazy bestsellers. And if you look at them, they, you know. So and and I gotta say, some some of my best friends are positive psychologists, um, <laughs> but they but they do it right. And there's a lot of people who do who do it wrong. I, I I've been to talks where I'm like, oh my god, you're telling people this. It's not it's not true. Um, and the, the other question was, was what I left out. I'll tell you what I left out. Um, if I was to write a chapter, write another chapter in the book, I would talk a lot more about AI and chat GPT and, what, and how that challenges our views. Um, one thing which more than one person has emailed me and they said, um, um, you got a chapter in Freud, where's Carl Jung? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I don't think I would add a chapter on Jung. I just don't think he has had the staying power of Freud, but I would talk more about AI. More about it. I would put in a plug for not a chapter, but like a, a little bit more. He's not young. He's kind of woo woo, and I don't yeah. know. Yeah, there, there was there was, there was even some ways a very appealing character. More in some way, more a character of our times than than Freud is. And it also, was, didn't he have a, sky, a psychotic break when he was younger? Right. I mean, I thought that was he did. I it, it wouldn't surprise me. Carl Jung. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think he had these visions of anyway. I, yeah. yeah. That would be anyway. I don't know if uh, uh, timing how, how we are doing, um, but I will keep going if we are. Oh, there we are. Oh, <laughs> oh, there we are, and there you are. I, I I can tell you can absolutely keep going and okay. really appreciate the lively, lively, lively back and forth. Thank you so much, Jen. Great job as always. You always bring always a game to everything that you do. So thank you so much. And we look forward to hosting you on May 4th. Anne-Marie, if you have that um, commercial, you can pop and chat one more time just to let people know. It's not on our website yet, but Jen is coming on May 4th back to talk about her forthcoming, uh, what, how would you call it, Jen? Um, it's uh, uh, my the story that I won the Pulitzer for, but but now bound between soft covers. It's an it's become a, a, an elegant little book. It's an elegant little book. Um, yeah. And it's going to be fabulous. And she's going to come talk with uh, Heidi Stevens. It's called On Grief, which is not the title of the article in The Atlantic, uh, but it is the, the incredible article that you wrote that you won the Pulitzer for last year. So we're thrilled to welcome you back in just, a, in just about a month and a half. So uh, if that, yeah. Um, I want to remind folks, um, Paul is going to be hanging out with us at After Hours. Buy a copy of this incredible book. You've only scratched the surface. There's so much in there. Um, so come buy a copy from the bookstore. We've been putting the links in chat. Um, you can come hang out, ask Paul your own questions. As you can see, he is a, a delightful raconteur. He can um, engage and he's, um, you know, uh, can can take it to a point. 
<laughs> I, a lot of people had some questions. I mean, I, I think that that question about both, um, Jen, someone had posted in chat when you said that this piece was about insecurities. Like, why are the two of you having a conversation? And you said, actually, I think it has to do with insecurity. Um, people were kind of curious about that, and as was I. Um, but I want to ask a question from that was submitted ahead of time, though I think the individual is here on the Zoom. And she says, what are the best ways to prevent ourselves from relying on tribal norms and instead use civic norms? That is to say, such as listening to those who disagree, being curious about and compassionate toward those who are different and think differently than we do and having the courage to dissent when we're in the minority. That is, that is such a good question, such a yeah. hard question. My answer to a lot of these questions of this sort would basically come down to how to be a better person, how to be the person which upon reflection I know I should be is that you don't get there just by trying really hard. Um, just like you don't lose weight by trying really hard. Or you don't become less racist by trying really hard. For something like this, it helps to sort of orchestrate your life in sort of systematic ways that bring out your better self. So, you know, we talked a bit about social media. Um, it's very simple way is to, is if you're on Twitter or Facebook, follow and relate to people with different views and, and try to fight against the sort of tribalism. Try to listen to people who, who offer intellect good examples of, of of different views that are intelligent and worth engaging in and try to take steps to sort of set up your your personal and your internet diet that connects that that it helps it helps get you where you want is it okay to maybe start off by just performing that until it feels authentic in, in um, the first point if you know what i mean fake it until you make it is one of the, the most profound bits of advice that ever rhymes um Jen, do you have thoughts as well well, I was only going to say that David French, who used to be at the Atlantic and is now a columnist at the Times, he once said something that I thought was so amazing. He said that whenever he follows anyone on Twitter, he then follows, he makes a point of following someone who's politically their opposite. That's and a, I think that's yeah. an incredibly disciplined practice. Mm -hmm. um, great conversation. Um, so I, everyone, we're going to stop here at eight, at eight o'clock. Paul, if you want to take us out with any final comment, I, um, we're going to give Paul a five minute break and then we'll open up the after hours room at about 8.05. Go ahead, Paul. I, I do. I want to, I just want to thank you, Lonnie, for having me. This has been a hoot. And Jen, I will send you an email expressing my effusive gratitude, but let me do it. Well, let me do it publicly. This was, you know, it was, it was such a delight and I really appreciate you taking the time. It was yeah. wonderful. I had, I had tons of fun. Always, always oh, lively and really um, just loving, really. It's it's perfect. 